U.S. History, an OpenStax textbook. Read along with the full text at www.openstax.org. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Chapter 12 Cotton is King, the Antebellum South, 1800 to 1860. Introduction Nine new slave states entered the Union between 1789 and 1860, rapidly expanding and transforming the South into a region of economic growth built on slave labor. In the image above, innumerable enslaved workers load cargo onto a steamship in the port of New Orleans, the commercial center of the antebellum South, while two well-dressed white men stand by talking. Commercial activity extends as far as the eye can see. By the mid-19th century, southern commercial centers like New Orleans had become home to the greatest concentration of wealth in the United States. While most white southerners did not own hold, they aspired to join the ranks of elite slaveholders who played a key role in the politics of both the South and the nation. Meanwhile, slavery shaped the culture and society of the South, which rested on a racial ideology of white supremacy and a vision of the United States as a white man's republic. Enslaved people endured the traumas of slavery by creating their own culture and using the Christian message of redemption to find hope for a world of freedom without violence. Twelve point one: The Economics of Cotton. Learning Objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain the labor-intensive processes of cotton production, describe the importance of cotton to the Atlantic and American antebellum economy. In the antebellum era that is, in the years before the Civil War, American planters in the South continued to grow Chesapeake tobacco and Carolina rice as they had in the colonial era. Cotton, however, emerged as the antebellum South's major commercial crop, eclipsing tobacco, rice, and sugar in economic importance. By 1860, the region was producing two-thirds of the world's cotton. In 1793, Eli Whitney revolutionized the production of cotton when he developed the cotton gin, likely influenced by suggestions from enslaved people. It was a device that separated the seeds from raw cotton. Suddenly, a process that was extraordinarily labor-intensive when done by hand could be completed quickly and easily. American plantation owners who were searching for a successful staple crop to compete on the world market found it in cotton. As a commodity, cotton had the advantage of being easily stored and transported. A demand for it already existed in the industrial textile mills in Great Britain, and in time, a steady stream of slave-grown American cotton would also supply northern textile mills. Southern cotton, picked and processed by enslaved labor, helped fuel the 19th century industrial revolution in both the United States and Great Britain. King Cotton. Almost no cotton was grown in the United States in 1787, the year the federal constitution was written. However, following the War of 1812, a huge increase in production resulted in the so-called cotton boom, and by mid-century, cotton became the key cash crop, a crop grown to sell, rather than for the farmer's sole use, of the southern economy and the most important American commodity. By 1850, of the 3.2 million enslaved people in the country's 15 slave states, 1.8 million were producing cotton. By 1860, enslaved labor was producing over 2 billion pounds of cotton per year. Indeed, American cotton soon made up two-thirds of the global supply, and production continued to soar. By the time of the Civil War, South Carolina politician James Hammond confidently proclaimed that the North could never threaten the South because cotton is king. The crop grown in the South was a hybrid, Gossipium barbadense, 
known as petty golf cotton, a mix of Mexican, Georgia, and Siamese strains. Pettit golf cotton grew extremely well in different soils and climates. It dominated cotton production in the Mississippi River Valley, home of the new slave states of Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Missouri, as well as in other states like Texas. Whenever new slave states entered the Union, white slaveholders sent armies of the enslaved to clear the land in order to grow and pick the lucrative crop. The phrase, to be sold down the river, used by Harriet Beecher Stowe in her 1852 novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, refers to this forced migration from the upper southern states to the deep south, lower on the Mississippi, to grow cotton. The enslaved people who built this cotton kingdom with their forced labor started by clearing the land. Although the Jeffersonian vision of the settlement of new U.S. territories entailed white yeoman farmers single-handedly carving out small, independent farms, the reality proved quite different. Entire old-growth forests and cypress swamps fell to the axe as enslaved people labored to strip the vegetation to make way for cotton. With the land cleared, they readied the earth by plowing and planting. To ambitious white planters, the extent of new land available for cotton production seemed almost limitless, and many planters simply leapfrogged from one area to the next, abandoning their fields every 10 to 15 years after the soil became exhausted. As a result, enslaved people composed the vanguard of this American expansion to the West. Cotton planting took place in March and April, when enslaved people planted seeds in rows around three to five feet apart. Over the next several months, from April to August, they carefully tended the plants. Weeding the cotton rows took significant energy and time. In August, after the cotton plants had flowered and the flowers had begun to give way to cotton bowls, the seed-bearing capsule that contains the cotton fiber, all the plantations enslaved men, women, and children worked together to pick the crop. On each day of cotton picking, enslaved workers went to the fields with sacks, which they would fill as many times as they could. The effort was laborious, and a white driver employed the lash to make the enslaved people work as quickly as possible. Cotton planters projected the amount of cotton they could harvest based on the number of enslaved people under their control. In general, planters expected a good hand or enslaved laborer to work 10 acres of land and pick 200 pounds of cotton a day. An overseer or master measured each enslaved individual's daily yield. Great pressure existed to meet the expected daily amount and some overseers whipped enslaved people who picked less than expected. Cotton picking occurred as many as seven times a season as the plant grew and continued to produce bowls through the fall and early winter. During the picking season, enslaved people worked from sunrise to sunset with a 10-minute break at lunch. Many slaveholders tended to give them little to eat since spending on food would cut into their profits. Other slaveholders knew that feeding the enslaved could increase productivity and therefore provided what they thought would help ensure a profitable crop. Enslaved people's day didn't end after they picked the cotton. Once they had brought it to the gin house to be weighed, they then had to care for the animals and perform other chores. Indeed, they often maintained their own gardens and livestock, which they tended after working the cotton fields in order to supplement their supply of food. Sometimes the cotton was dried before it was ginned, put through the process of separating the seeds from the cotton fiber. The cotton gin allowed an enslaved laborer to remove the seeds from 50 pounds of cotton a day, compared to one pound if done by hand. After the seeds had been removed, the cotton was pressed into bales. These bales, weighing about 400 to 500 pounds, were wrapped in burlap cloth and sent down the Mississippi River. As the cotton industry boomed in the South, the Mississippi River quickly became the essential water highway in the United States. Steamboats, a crucial part of the transportation revolution, thanks to their enormous freight-carrying capacity and ability to navigate shallow waterways, became a defining component 
of the Cotton Kingdom. Steamboats also illustrated the class and social distinctions of the antebellum age. While the decks carried precious cargo, ornate rooms graced the interior. In these spaces, white people socialized in the ship saloons and dining halls, while enslaved black people served them. Investors poured huge sums into steamships. In 1817, only 17 plied the waters of western rivers. But by 1837, there were over 700 steamships in operation. Major new ports developed at St. Louis, Missouri, Memphis, Tennessee, and other locations. By 1860, some 3,500 vessels were steaming in and out of New Orleans, carrying an annual cargo made up primarily of cotton that amounted to $220 million worth of goods, approximately $6.5 billion in the year 2014. New Orleans had been part of the French Empire before the United States purchased it, along with the rest of the Louisiana Territory, in 1803. In the first half of the 19th century, it rose in prominence and importance largely because of the cotton boom, steam-powered river traffic, and its strategic position near the mouth of the Mississippi River. Steamboats moved down the river, transporting cotton grown on plantations along the river and throughout the south to the port at New Orleans. From there, the bulk of American cotton went to Liverpool, England, where it was sold to British manufacturers who ran the cotton mills in Manchester and elsewhere. This lucrative international trade brought new wealth and new residents to the city. By 1840, New Orleans alone had 12% of the nation's total banking capital, and visitors often commented on the great cultural diversity of the city. In 1835, Joseph Holt Ingram wrote, Truly does New Orleans represent every other city and nation upon earth. I know of none where is congregated so great a variety of the human species. Slave labor, cotton, and the steamship transformed the city from a relatively isolated corner of North America in the 18th century to a thriving metropolis that rivaled New York in importance. The domestic slave trade the South's dependence on cotton was matched by its dependence on stolen labor from enslaved people to harvest the cotton. Despite the rhetoric of the revolution that all men are created equal, slavery not only endured in the American Republic, but formed the very foundation of the country's economic success. Cotton and slavery occupied a central and intertwined place in the 19th century economy. In 1807, the U.S. Congress abolished the foreign slave trade, a ban that went into effect on January 1, 1808. After this date, importing captives from Africa became illegal in the United States. While smuggling continued to occur, the end of the international slave trade meant that enslaved domestic people were in very high demand. Fortunately for Americans whose wealth depended upon the exploitation of slave labor, a fall in the price of tobacco had caused landowners in the Upper South to reduce their production of this crop and use more of their land to grow wheat, which was far more profitable. While tobacco was a labor-intensive crop that required many people to cultivate it, wheat was not. Former tobacco farmers in the older states of Virginia and Maryland found themselves with surplus enslaved people whom they were obligated to feed, clothe, and shelter. Some slaveholders responded to this situation by releasing enslaved people, far more decided to sell their excess bondsmen. Virginia and Maryland therefore took the lead in the domestic slave trade, the trading of enslaved people within the borders of the United States. The domestic slave trade offered many economic opportunities for white men. Those who sold the enslaved could realize great profits as could the slave brokers who served as middlemen between sellers and buyers. Other white men could benefit from the trade as owners of warehouses and pens in which the enslaved were held, or as suppliers of clothing and food for enslaved people on the move. Between 1790 and 1859, slaveholders in Virginia sold more than half a million people. 
In the early part of this period, many were sold to people living in Kentucky, Tennessee, and North and South Carolina. By the 1820s, however, people in Kentucky and the Carolinas had begun to sell many of the people they held in bondage. Maryland slave dealers sold at least 185,000 people. Kentucky slaveholders sold some 71,000 individuals. Most of the slave traders forced these enslaved people south to Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. New Orleans, the hub of commerce, boasted the largest slave market in the United States and grew to become the nation's fourth largest city as a result. Natchez, Mississippi had the second largest market. In Virginia, Maryland, the Carolinas, and elsewhere in the South, slave auctions happened every day. All told, the movement of enslaved people in the South made up one of the largest forced internal migrations in the United States. In each of the decades between 1820 and 1860, about 200,000 people were sold and relocated. The 1800 census recorded over 1 million African Americans, of which nearly 900,000 had slave status. By 1860, the total number of African Americans increased to 4.4 million, and of that number, 3.95 million were held in bondage. For many of the enslaved, the domestic slave trade incited the terror of being sold away from family and friends. My story. Solomon Northup remembers the New Orleans slave market. Solomon Northup was a free black man living in Saratoga, New York, when he was kidnapped and sold into slavery in 1841. He later escaped and wrote a book about his experiences, 12 Years a Slave. Narrative of Solomon Northup, a citizen of New York, kidnapped in Washington City in 1841 and rescued in 1853, the basis of a 2013 Academy Award-winning film. This excerpt derives from Northup's description of being sold in New Orleans, along with fellow slave Eliza and her children, Randall and Emily. One old gentleman who said he wanted a coachman appeared to take a fancy to me. The same man also purchased Randall. The little fellow was made to jump and run across the floor and perform many other feats, exhibiting his activity and condition. All the time the trade was going on, Eliza was crying aloud and wringing her hands. She besought the man not to buy him unless he also bought herself and Emily. Freeman turned round to her savagely with his whip in his uplifted hand, ordering her to stop her noise, or he would flog her. He would not have such work, such sniveling, and unless she ceased that minute, he would take her to the yard and give her a hundred lashes. Eliza shrunk before him and tried to wipe away her tears, but it was all in vain. She wanted to be with her children, she said, the little time she had to live. All the frowns and threats of Freeman could not wholly silence the afflicted mother. What does Northup's narrative tell you about the experience of being enslaved? How does he characterize Freeman, the slave trader? How does he characterize Eliza? The South in the American and World Markets The first half of the 19th century saw a market revolution in the United States, one in which industrialization brought changes to both the production and the consumption of goods. Some Southerners of the time believed that their region's reliance on a single cash crop and its use of stolen labor to produce it, gave the South economic independence and made it immune from the effects of these changes, but this was far from the truth. Indeed, the production of cotton brought the South more firmly into the larger American and Atlantic markets. Northern mills depended on the South for supplies of raw cotton that was then converted into textiles. But this domestic cotton market paled in comparison to the Atlantic market. About 75% of the cotton produced in the United States was eventually exported abroad. Exporting at such high volumes made the United States the undisputed world leader in cotton production. Between the years 1820 and 1860, approximately 80% of the global cotton supply was produced in the United States. Nearly all the exported cotton was shipped to Great Britain fueling its burgeoning textile industry and making the powerful British Empire increasingly dependent on American cotton and Southern slavery. The power of cotton on the world market may have brought wealth to the South, but 
it also increased its economic dependence on other countries and other parts of the United States. Much of the corn and pork that enslaved people consumed came from farms in the West. Some of the inexpensive clothing, called slops, and shoes worn by enslaved people were manufactured in the North. The North also supplied the furnishings found in the homes of both wealthy planters and members of the middle class. Many of the trappings of domestic life, such as carpets, lamps, dinnerware, upholstered furniture, books, and musical instruments, all the accoutrements of comfortable living for Southern white people, were made in either the North or Europe. Southern planters also borrowed money from banks in Northern cities, and in the Southern summers, took advantage of the developments in transportation to travel to resorts at Saratoga, New York, Litchfield, Connecticut, and Newport, Rhode Island. Twelve point two, African Americans in the antebellum United States. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to discuss the similarities and differences in the lives of enslaved and free Black people. Describe the independent culture and customs that enslaved people developed. In addition to cotton, the great commodity of the antebellum South was human chattel. Slavery was the cornerstone of the Southern economy. By 1850, about 3.2 million enslaved people labored in the United States, 1.8 million of whom worked in the cotton fields. They faced arbitrary power abuses from white people. They coped by creating family and community networks. Storytelling, song, and Christianity also provided solace and allowed enslaved individuals to develop their own interpretations of their condition. Life as an enslaved person. Southern white people frequently relied upon the idea of paternalism, the premise that white slaveholders acted in the best interests of those they enslaved, taking responsibility for their care, feeding, discipline, and even their Christian morality to justify the existence of slavery. This grossly misrepresented the reality of slavery, which was, by any measure, a dehumanizing, traumatizing, and horrifying human disaster and crime against humanity. Nevertheless, the enslaved were hardly passive victims of their conditions. They sought and found myriad ways to resist their shackles and develop their own communities and cultures. Enslaved people often used the notion of paternalism to their advantage, finding opportunities within this system to engage in acts of resistance and win a degree of freedom and autonomy. For example, some played into their enslavers' racism by hiding their intelligence and feigning childishness and ignorance. The enslaved could then slow down the workday and sabotage the system in small ways by accidentally breaking tools, for example. The slaveholder, seeing the enslaved as unsophisticated and childlike, would believe these incidents were accidents rather than rebellions. Some enslaved individuals engaged in more dramatic forms of resistance, such as poisoning their captors slowly. Other enslaved people reported their fellow captives to their slaveholders, hoping to gain preferential treatment. Those who informed their holders about planned slave rebellions could often expect the slaveholder's gratitude and, perhaps, more lenient treatment. Such expectations were always tempered by the individual personality and caprice of the slaveholder. Slaveholders used both psychological coercion and physical violence to prevent enslaved people from disobeying their wishes. Often, the most efficient way to discipline people was to threaten to sell them. The lash, while the most common form of punishment, was effective but not efficient. Whippings sometimes left the victims incapacitated or even dead. Slaveholders and overseers also used punishment gear like neck braces, balls and chains, leg irons, and paddles with holes to produce blood blisters. The enslaved lived in constant terror of both physical violence and separation from family and friends. Under Southern law, enslaved people could not marry. Nonetheless, some slaveholders allowed marriages to promote the birth of children and to foster harmony on plantations.
Some slaveholders even forced certain individuals to form unions, anticipating the birth of more children, and consequently greater profits from them. Slaveholders sometimes allowed enslaved people to choose their own partners, but they could also veto a match. Enslaved couples always faced the prospect of being sold away from each other, and once they had children, the horrifying reality that their children could be sold and sent away at any time. Enslaved parents had to show their children the best way to survive under slavery. This meant teaching them to be discreet, submissive, and guarded around white people. Parents also taught their children through the stories they told. Popular stories among the enslaved included tales of tricksters, sly captives, or animals like Brer Rabbit, who outwitted their antagonists. Such stories provided comfort in humor and conveyed the sense of the wrongs of slavery. Enslaved people's work songs commented on the harshness of their life and often had double meanings, a literal meaning that white people would not find offensive and a deeper meaning for the enslaved. African beliefs, including ideas about the spiritual world and the importance of African healers, survived in the South as well. White people who became aware of non-Christian rituals among the enslaved labeled such practices as witchcraft. Among Africans, however, the rituals and use of various plants by respected enslaved healers created connections between the African past and the American South, while also providing a sense of community and identity for enslaved individuals. Other African customs, including traditional naming patterns, the making of baskets, and the cultivation of certain native African plants that had been brought to the New World, also endured. Americana African Americans and Christian Spirituals Many of the enslaved embraced Christianity. Their holders emphasized a scriptural message of obedience to white people and a better day awaiting them in heaven, but enslaved people focused on the uplifting message of being freed from bondage. The styles of worship in the Methodist and Baptist churches, which emphasized emotional responses to scripture, attracted the enslaved to those traditions and inspired some to become preachers. Spiritual songs that reference the Exodus, the biblical account of the Hebrews' escape from slavery in Egypt, such as Roll, Jordan, Roll, allowed enslaved individuals to freely express messages of hope, struggle, and overcoming adversity. What imagery might the Jordan River suggest to enslaved people working in the Deep South? What lyrics in this song suggest redemption and a better world ahead? The Free Black Population Complicating the picture of the antebellum South was the existence of a large free black population. In fact, more free black people lived in the South than in the North. Roughly 261,000 lived in slave states, while 226,000 lived in northern states without slavery. Most free black people did not live in the Lower or Deep South. The states of Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas. Instead, the largest number lived in the upper southern states of Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and later Kentucky, Missouri, Tennessee, and the District of Columbia. Part of the reason for the large number of free black people living in slave states were the many instances of manumission, the formal granting of freedom to enslaved people that occurred as a result of the revolution when many slaveholders put into action the ideal that all men are created equal and released the people they enslaved. The transition in the Upper South to the staple crop of wheat, which did not require large numbers of enslaved laborers to produce, also spurred manumissions. Another large group of free black people in the South had been free residents of Louisiana before the 1803 Louisiana Purchase, while still other free black people came from Cuba and Haiti. Most free black people in the South lived in cities, and a majority of free black people were lighter-skinned women, a reflection of the interracial unions that formed between white men and black women. Everywhere in the United States, blackness had come to be associated with slavery, the station at the bottom of the social ladder. Both white people and those with African ancestry 
intended to delineate varying degrees of lightness and skin color in a social hierarchy. In the slave-holding South, different names described one's distance from blackness or whiteness. Mulattoes, those with one black and one white parent, quadroons, those with one black grandparent, and octoroons, those with one black great-grandparent. Lighter-skinned black people often looked down on their darker counterparts, an indication of the ways in which both white and black people internalized the racism of the age. Some free black people in the South owned enslaved people themselves. Andrew Durnford, for example, was born in New Orleans in 1800, three years before the Louisiana Purchase. His father was white, and his mother was a free black woman. Durnford became an American citizen after the Louisiana Purchase, rising to prominence as a Louisiana sugar planter and slaveholder. William Ellison, another free black person who amassed great wealth and power in the South, was born with a slave status in 1790 in South Carolina. After buying his freedom and that of his wife and daughter, he proceeded to purchase his own enslaved people, whom he then put to work manufacturing cotton gins. By the eve of the Civil War, Ellison had become one of the richest and largest slaveholders in the entire state. The phenomenon of free black people amassing large fortunes within a slave society predicated on racial difference, however, was exceedingly rare. Most free black people in the South lived under the specter of slavery and faced many obstacles. Beginning in the early 19th century, southern states increasingly made manumission illegal. They also devised laws that divested free black people of their rights, such as the right to testify against white people in court or the right to seek employment where they pleased. Interestingly, it was in the upper southern states that such laws were the harshest. In Virginia, for example, legislators made efforts to require free black people to leave the state. In parts of the Deep South, free black people were able to maintain their rights more easily. The difference in treatment between free black people in the Deep South and those in the Upper South, historians have surmised, came down to economics. In the Deep South, slavery as an institution was strong and profitable. In the Upper South, the opposite was true. The anxiety of this economic uncertainty manifested in the form of harsh laws that targeted free black people. Slave Revolts Captives resisted their enslavement in small ways every day, but this resistance did not usually translate into mass uprisings. The enslaved understood that the chances of ending slavery through rebellion were slim and would likely result in massive retaliation. Many also feared the risk that participating in such actions would pose to themselves and their families. White slaveholders, however, constantly feared uprisings and took drastic steps, including torture and mutilation, whenever they believed that rebellions might be simmering. Gripped by the fear of insurrection, white people often imagined revolts to be in the works even when no uprising actually happened. At least two major slave uprisings did occur in the antebellum South. In 1811, a major rebellion broke out in the sugar parishes of the booming territory of Louisiana. Inspired by the successful overthrow of the white planter class in Haiti, a group of people enslaved in Louisiana took up arms against slaveholders. Perhaps as many 500 joined the rebellion, led by Charles Deslandais, a mixed-race slave driver on a sugar plantation owned by Manuel Andre. The revolt began in January 1811 on Andre's plantation. Desland and others attacked the Andre household, where they killed the slaveholder's son, although Andre himself escaped. The rebels then began traveling toward New Orleans, armed with weapons gathered at Andre's plantation. Militias mobilized to stop the rebellion, but not before Deslandes and the other enslaved people set fire to three plantations and killed numerous white people. A small force led by Andre ultimately captured Deslandes, whose body was mutilated and burned following his execution. 
other rebels were beheaded and their heads placed on pikes along the Mississippi River. The second rebellion, led by the enslaved Nat Turner, occurred in 1831 in Southampton County, Virginia. Turner had suffered not only from personal enslavement, but also from the additional trauma of having his wife sold away from him. Bolstered by Christianity, Turner became convinced that like Christ, he should lay down his life to end slavery. Mustering his relatives and friends, he began the rebellion August 22nd, killing scores of white people in the county. White people mobilized quickly and within 48 hours had brought the rebellion to an end. Shocked by Nat Turner's rebellion, Virginia's state legislature considered ending slavery in the state in order to provide greater security. In the end, legislators decided slavery would remain and that their state would continue to play a key role in the domestic slave trade. Slave Markets As discussed above, after centuries of slave trade with West Africa, Congress banned the further importation of enslaved Africans beginning in 1808. The domestic slave trade then expanded rapidly. As the cotton trade grew in size and importance, so did the domestic slave trade. The cultivation of cotton gave new life and importance to slavery, increasing the value of enslaved individuals. To meet the South's fierce demand for labor, American smugglers illegally transferred captives through Florida and later through Texas. Many more enslaved Africans arrived illegally from Cuba. Indeed, Cubans relied on the smuggling of enslaved people to prop up their finances. The largest number of enslaved people after 1808, however, came from the massive legal internal slave market in which slave states in the Upper South sold enslaved men, women, and children to states in the Lower South. For the enslaved, the domestic trade presented the full horrors of slavery as children were ripped from their mothers and fathers and families destroyed, creating heartbreak and alienation. Some slaveholders sought to increase the number of enslaved children by placing enslaved males with fertile enslaved females, and slaveholders routinely raped enslaved females. The resulting births played an important role in slavery's expansion in the first half of the 19th century, as many enslaved children were born as a result of rape. One account, written by an enslaved person named William J. Anderson, captures the horror of sexual exploitation in the antebellum South. Anderson wrote about how a Mississippi slaveholder divested a poor female slave of all wearing apparel, tied her down to stakes, and whipped her with a handsaw until he broke it over her naked body. In process of time he ravished, that is, raped, her person, and became the father of a child by her. Besides, he always kept a colored miss in the house with him. This is another curse of slavery, concubinage, and illegitimate connections, which is carried on to an alarming extent in the far south. A poor slave man who lives close by his wife is permitted to visit her but very seldom, and other men, both white and colored, cohabit with her. It is undoubtedly the worst place of incest and bigamy in the world. A white man thinks nothing of putting a colored man out to carry the fore row, the front row in field work, and carry on the same sport with the colored man's wife at the same time. Anderson, a devout Christian, recognized and explains in his narrative that one of the evils of slavery is the way it undermines the family. Anderson was not the only critic of slavery to emphasize this point. Frederick Douglass, an enslaved person from Maryland who escaped to the North in 1838, elaborated on this dimension of slavery in his 1845 narrative. He recounted how enslavers had to sell their own children, whom they had with enslaved women to appease the white wives who despised their offspring. The selling of enslaved people was a major business enterprise in the antebellum South, representing a key part of the economy. White men invested substantial sums in enslaved people, carefully calculating the annual returns they could expect from each enslaved person, as well as the possibility of greater profits through natural increase. The domestic slave trade was highly visible, 
and like the infamous Middle Passage that brought captive Africans to the Americas, it constituted an equally disruptive and horrifying journey now called the Second Middle Passage. Between 1820 and 1860, white American traders sold a million or more captives in the domestic slave market. Groups of enslaved people were transported by ship from places like Virginia, a state that specialized in raising enslaved people for sale, to New Orleans, where they were sold to planters in the Mississippi Valley. Others made the overland trek from older states like North Carolina to new and booming Deep South states like Alabama. New Orleans had the largest slave market in the United States. Slaveholders brought the people they enslaved there from the East, Virginia, Maryland, and the Carolinas, and the West, Tennessee, and Kentucky, to be sold for work in the Mississippi Valley. The slave trade benefited white people in the Chesapeake and Carolinas, providing them with extra income. A healthy young enslaved male in the 1850s could be sold for $1,000, approximately $30,000 in the year 2014, and a planter who could sell 10 such enslaved people collected a windfall. In fact, by the 1850s, the demand for enslaved people reached an all-time high, and prices therefore doubled. An enslaved person who would have sold for $400 in the 1820s could command a price of $800 in the 1850s. The high price of enslaved people in the 1850s and the inability of natural increase to satisfy demands led some Southerners to demand the reopening of the international slave trade, a movement that caused a rift between the Upper South and the Lower South. White people in the Upper South who sold enslaved people to their counterparts in the Lower South worried that reopening the trade would lower prices and therefore hurt their profits. My story. John Brown on Slave Life in Georgia An enslaved person named John Brown lived in Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia before he escaped and moved to England. While there, he dictated his autobiography to someone at the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, who published it in 1855. I really thought my mother would have died of grief at being obliged to leave her two children, her mother and her relations behind. But it was of no use lamenting. The few things we had were put together that night and we completed our preparations for being parted for life by kissing one another over and over again, and saying goodbye till some of us little ones fell asleep. And here I may as well tell what kind of man our new master was. He was of small stature and thin but very strong. He had sandy hair, a very red face, and chewed tobacco. His countenance had a very cruel expression, and his disposition was a match for it. He was, indeed, a very bad man, and used to flog us dreadfully. He would make his slaves work on one meal a day until quite night, and after supper set them to burn brush or spin cotton. We worked from four in the morning till twelve before we broke our fast, and from that time till eleven or twelve at night, we labored eighteen hours a day. John Brown, Slave Life in Georgia, a narrative of the life, sufferings, and escape of John Brown, a fugitive slave now in England, 1855. What features of the domestic slave trade does Brown's narrative illuminate? Why do you think he brought his story to an anti-slavery society? How do you think people responded to this narrative? Twelve point three, Wealth and Culture in the South Learning Objectives By the end of this section, you will be able to Assess the distribution of wealth in the antebellum South Describe the Southern culture of honor Identify the main pro-slavery arguments in the years prior to the Civil War during the antebellum years, wealthy Southern planters formed an elite class that wielded most of the economic and political power of the region. They created their own standards of gentility and honor, defining ideals of Southern white manhood and womanhood and shaping the culture of the South. To defend the system of forced labor on which their economic survival and genteel lifestyles depended, elite Southerners developed several pro-slavery arguments that they levied at those who would see the institution dismantled. Slavery and the White Class Structure The South prospered, but its wealth was very unequally distributed. Upward, social mobility did not exist for the millions of enslaved people who produced a good portion of the nation's wealth, while poor Southern white people envisioned a day when they might rise enough in the world 
to own enslaved people of their own. Because of the cotton boom, there were more millionaires per capita in the Mississippi River Valley by 1860 than anywhere else in the United States. However, in that same year, only 3% of white people enslaved more than 50 people, and two-thirds of white households in the South did not enslave any people at all. Distribution of wealth in the South became less democratic over time. Fewer white people enslaved people in 1860 than in 1840. At the top of Southern white society stood the planter elite, which comprised two groups. In the Upper South, an aristocratic gentry, generation upon generation of whom had grown up with slavery, held a privileged place. In the Deep South, an elite group of slaveholders gained new wealth from cotton. Some members of this group hailed from established families in the eastern states, Virginia and the Carolinas, while others came from humbler backgrounds. South Carolinian Nathaniel Hayward, a wealthy rice planter and member of the aristocratic gentry, came from an established family and sat atop the pyramid of southern slaveholders. He amassed an enormous estate, in 1850, he enslaved more than 1,800 people. When he died in 1851, he left an estate worth more than $2 million, approximately $63 million in the year 2014. As cotton production increased, new wealth flowed to the cotton planters. These planters became the staunchest defenders of slavery, and as their wealth grew, they gained considerable political power. One member of the planter elite was Edward Lloyd Faf, who came from an established and wealthy family of Talbot County, Maryland. Lloyd had inherited his position rather than rising to it through his own labors. His hundreds of enslaved people formed a crucial part of his wealth. Like many of the planter elite, Lloyd's plantation was a masterpiece of elegant architecture and gardens. One of the people enslaved on Lloyd's plantation was Frederick Douglass, who escaped in 1838 and became an abolitionist leader, writer, statesman, and orator in the North. In his autobiography, Douglass described the plantation's elaborate gardens and racehorses, but also its underfed and brutalized enslaved population. Lloyd provided employment opportunities to other white people in Talbot County, many of whom served as slave traders and the slave breakers, entrusted with beating and overworking unruly enslaved people into submission. Like other members of the planter elite, Lloyd himself served in a variety of local and national political offices. He was governor of Maryland from 1809 to 1811, a member of the House of Representatives from 1807 to 1809, and a senator from 1819 to 1826. As a representative and a senator, Lloyd defended slavery as the foundation of the American economy. Wealthy plantation owners like Lloyd came close to forming an American ruling class in the years before the Civil War. They helped shape foreign and domestic policy with one goal in view, to expand the power and reach of the Cotton Kingdom of the South. Socially, they cultivated a refined manner and believed white people, especially members of their class, should not perform manual labor. Rather, they created an identity for themselves based on a world of leisure in which horse racing and entertainment mattered greatly and where the enslavement of others was the bedrock of civilization. Below the wealthy planters were the yeoman farmers or small landowners. Below yeomen were poor, landless white people who made up the majority of white people in the South. These landless white men dreamed of owning land and enslaving people, and served as slave overseers, drivers, and traders in the Southern economy. In fact, owning land and enslaved people provided one of the only opportunities for upward social and economic mobility. In the South, living the American dream meant enslaving people, producing cotton, and owning land. Despite this unequal distribution of wealth, non-slaveholding white people shared with white slaveholders a common set of values, most notably a belief in white supremacy. White people, whether rich or poor, were bound together by racism. 
slavery diffused class tensions among them because no matter how poor they were, white Southerners had race in common with the mighty plantation owners. Non-slaveholders accepted the rule of the planters as defenders of their shared interest in maintaining a racial hierarchy. Significantly, all white people were also bound together by the constant prevailing fear of slave uprisings. Non-slaveholding white people took part in civil duties. They served on juries and voted. They also engaged in the daily rounds of maintaining slavery by serving on neighborhood patrols to ensure that enslaved people did not escape and that rebellions did not occur. The practical consequence of such activities was that the institution of slavery and its perpetuation became a source of commonality among different economic and social tires that otherwise were separated by a gulf of difference. Southern planters exerted a powerful influence on the federal government. Seven of the first 11 presidents were enslavers, and more than half of the Supreme Court justices who served on the court from its inception to the Civil War came from slaveholding states. However, Southern white yeoman farmers generally did not support an active federal government. They were suspicious of the state bank and supported President Jackson's dismantling of the Second Bank of the United States. They also did not support taxes to create internal improvements, such as canals and railroads. To them, government involvement in the economic life of the nation disrupted what they perceived as the natural workings of the economy. They also feared a strong national government might tamper with slavery. Planters operated within a larger capitalist society, but the labor system they used to produce goods, that is, slavery, was similar to systems that existed before capitalism, such as feudalism and serfdom. Under capitalism, free workers are paid for their labor by owners of capital to produce commodities. The money from the sale of the goods is used to pay for the work performed. As enslaved people did not reap any earnings from their forced labor, some economic historians consider the antebellum plantation system a pre-capitalist system. My story. Dr. Hundley on the Southern Yeoman. Daniel Robinson Hundley was a well-educated lawyer who was born into a slaveholding family from Alabama. He earned a degree from Harvard and resided in the North, where he began working on a book meant to counter the common Northern assumption, including that the South was made up exclusively of two tiers of white residents, the very wealthy planter class and the very poor landless white people. In his 1860 book, Social Relations in Our Southern States, Hundley describes what he calls the Southern Yeoman, a social group he insists is roughly equivalent to the middle-class farmers of the North. But you have no yeoman in the South, my dear sir. Beg your pardon, our dear sir, but we have hosts of them. I thought you had only poor white trash. Yes, we dare say as much, and that the moon is made of green cheese. Know then that the poor whites of the South constitute a separate class to themselves. The Southern yeomen are as distinct from them as the Southern gentleman is from the cotton snob. Certainly the Southern yeomen are nearly always poor, at least so far as this world's goods are to be taken into account. As a general thing, they own no slaves, and even in case they do, the wealthiest of them rarely possess more than from ten to fifteen. The Southern yeoman much resembles in his speech, religious opinions, household arrangements, indoor sports, and family traditions, the middle-class farmers of the northern states. He is fully as intelligent as the latter and is on the whole much better versed in the lore of politics and the provisions of our federal and state constitutions. Although not as a class pecuniarily interested in slave property, the southern yeomanry are almost unanimously pro-slavery in sentiment. Nor do we see how any honest, thoughtful person can reasonably find fault with them on this account. Dr. Hundley's Social Relations in Our Southern States, 1860 what elements of social relations in the South is Hundley attempting to emphasize for his readers? In what respects might his position as an educated person born into a relatively wealthy family influence his understanding of social relations in the South? Honor in the South A complicated code of honor among privileged white Southerners, dictating the beliefs and behavior of gentlemen and ladies, developed in the antebellum years. Maintaining appearances and reputation was supremely important. It can be argued that, 
as in many societies, the concept of honor in the antebellum South had much to do with control over dependents, whether enslaved people, wives, or relatives. Defending their honor and ensuring that they received proper respect became preoccupations of white people in the slaveholding South. To question another man's assertions was to call his honor and reputation into question. Insults in the form of words or behavior, such as calling someone a coward, could trigger a rupture that might well end on the dueling ground. Dueling had largely disappeared in the antebellum North by the early 19th century, but it remained an important part of the Southern Code of Honor through the Civil War years. Southern white men, especially those of high social status, settled their differences with duels, before which antagonists usually attempted reconciliation, often through the exchange of letters addressing the alleged insult. If the challenger was not satisfied by the exchange, a duel would often result. The dispute between South Carolina's James Hammond and his erstwhile friend and brother-in-law, Wade Hampton, the second, illustrates the Southern culture of honor and the place of the duel in that culture. A strong friendship bound Hammond and Hampton together. Both stood at the top of South Carolina's society as successful, married plantation owners involved in state politics. Prior to his election as governor of the state in 1842, Hammond became sexually involved with each of Hampton's four teenage daughters, who were his nieces by marriage. Hampton found out about these acts, and in keeping with the code of honor, could have demanded a duel with Hammond. However, Hampton instead tried to use the liaisons to destroy his former friend politically. This effort proved disastrous for Hampton because it represented a violation of the Southern Code of Honor. As matters now stand, Hammond wrote, Hampton is a convicted dastard who, not having nerve to redress his own wrongs, put forward bullies to do it for him. To challenge me to a duel would be to throw himself upon my mercy, for he knows I'm not bound to meet him for a duel. Because Hampton's behavior marked him as a man who lacked honor, Hammond was no longer bound to meet Hampton in a duel, even if Hampton were to demand one. Hammond's reputation, though tarnished, remained high in the esteem of South Carolinians, and the governor went on to serve as a U.S. senator from 1857 to 1860. As for the four Hampton daughters, they never married. Their names were disgraced, not only by the whispered-about scandal, but by their father's actions in response to it. And no man of honor in South Carolina would stoop so low as to marry them. Gender and the Southern Household The antebellum South was an especially male-dominated society. Far more than in the North, Southern men, particularly wealthy planters, were patriarchs and sovereigns of their own household. Among the white members of the household, labor and daily ritual conformed to rigid gender delineations. Men represented their household in the larger world of politics, business, and war. Within the family, the patriarchal male was the ultimate authority. White women were relegated to the household and lived under the thumb and protection of the male patriarch. The ideal Southern lady conformed to her prescribed gender role, a role that was largely domestic and subservient. While responsibilities and experiences varied across different social tiers, women's subordinate state in relation to the male patriarch remained the same. Writers in the antebellum period were fond of celebrating the image of the ideal Southern woman. One such writer, Thomas Roderick Dew, president of Virginia's College of William and Mary in the mid-19th century, wrote approvingly of the virtue of Southern women, a virtue he concluded derived from their natural weakness, piety, grace, and modesty. In his dissertation on the characteristic differences between the sexes, he writes that Southern women derive their power not by leading armies to combat, or of enabling her to bring into more formidable action the physical power which nature has conferred on her. No, it is but the better to perfect all those feminine graces, all those fascinating attributes, which render her the center of attraction, and which delight and charm all those who breathe the atmosphere in which she moves. And in the language of Mr. Burke, 
would make ten thousand swords leap from their scabbards to avenge the insult that might be offered to her. By her very meekness and beauty does she subdue all around her. Such popular idealizations of elite southern white women, however, are difficult to reconcile with their lived experience. In their own words, these women frequently describe the trauma of childbirth, the loss of children, and the loneliness of the plantation. For white slaveholders, the male-dominated household operated to protect gender divisions and prevalent gender norms. For enslaved women, however, the same system exposed them to brutality and frequent sexual domination. The demands on the labor of enslaved women made it impossible for them to perform the role of domestic caretaker that was so idealized by Southern men. That slaveholders put them out into the fields, where they frequently performed work traditionally thought of as male, reflected little the ideal image of gentleness and delicacy reserved for white women. Nor did the enslaved woman's role as daughter, wife, or mother garner any patriarchal protection. Each of these roles and the relationships they defined was subject to the prerogative of a slaveholder who could freely violate enslaved women's persons, sell off their children, or separate them from their families. My Story, Louisa Sheves McCord's Woman's Progress Louisa Sheves McCord was born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1810. A child of some privilege in the South, she received an excellent education and became a prolific writer. As the excerpt from her poem, Woman's Progress, indicates, some Southern women also contributed to the idealization of Southern white womanhood. Sweet sister, stoop not thou to be a man. Man has his place as woman hers, and she, as maid to comfort, minister and help. Molded for gentler duties, ill fulfills his jarring destinies. Her mission is to labor and to pray, to help, to heal, to soothe, to bear, patient with smiles to suffer, and with self-abnegation noble lose her private interest in the dearer weal of those she loves and lives for. Call not this the all-fulfilling of her destiny, she the world's soothing mother. Call it not, with scorn and mocking sneer, a drudgery. The ribald tongue profanes heaven's holiest things, but holy still they are. The lowliest tasks are sanctified in nobly acting them. Christ washed the apostles' feet, not thus cast shame upon the godlike in him. Woman lives man's constant prophet. If her life be true, and based upon the instincts of her being, she is a living sermon of that truth, which ever through her gentle actions speaks, that life is given to labor and to love. Louisa Susanna Sheves McCord. Woman's Progress. 1853. What womanly virtues does Louisa Sheves McCord emphasize? How might her social status as an educated Southern woman of great privilege influence her understanding of gender relations in the South? Defending Slavery With the rise of democracy during the Jacksonian era in the 1830s, slaveholders worried about the power of the majority. If political power went to a majority that was hostile to slavery, the South, and the honor of white Southerners, would be imperiled. White Southerners, keen on preserving the institution of slavery, bristled at what they perceived to be Northern attempts to deprive them of their livelihood. Powerful Southerners like South Carolinian John C. Calhoun highlighted laws like the Tariff of 1828 as evidence of the North's desire to destroy the Southern economy and, by extension, its culture. Such a tariff, he and others concluded, would disproportionately harm the South, which relied heavily on imports and benefit the North, which would receive protections for its manufacturing centers. The tariff appeared to open the door for other federal initiatives, including the abolition of slavery. Because of this perceived threat to Southern society, Calhoun argued that states could nullify federal laws. This belief illustrated the importance of the state's rights argument to the Southern states. It also showed slaveholders' willingness to unite against the federal government when they believed it acted unjustly against their interests. As the nation expanded in the 1830s and 1840s, the writings of abolitionists, a small but vocal group of Northerners committed to ending slavery, 
reached a larger national audience. White Southerners responded by putting forth arguments in defense of slavery, their way of life, and their honor. Calhoun became a leading political theorist defending slavery and the rights of the South, which he saw as containing an increasingly embattled minority. He advanced the idea of a concurrent majority, a majority of a separate region, that would otherwise be in the minority of the nation, with the power to veto or disallow legislation put forward by a hostile majority. Calhoun's idea of the concurrent majority found full expression in his 1850 essay, Disquisition on Government. In this treatise, he wrote about government as a necessary means to ensure the preservation of society since society existed to preserve and protect our race. If government grew hostile to society, then a concurrent majority had to take action, including forming a new government. Disquisition on government advanced a profoundly anti-democratic argument. It illustrates Southern leaders' intense suspicion of democratic majorities and their ability to affect legislation that would challenge Southern interests. White Southerners reacted strongly to abolitionists' attacks on slavery. In making their defense of slavery, they critiqued wage labor in the North. They argued that the Industrial Revolution had brought about a new type of slavery, wage slavery, and that this form of slavery was far worse than the slave labor used on Southern plantations. Defenders of the institution also lashed out directly at abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison for daring to call into question their way of life. Indeed, Virginian cited Garrison as the instigator of Nat Turner's 1831 rebellion. The Virginian George Fitzhugh contributed to the defense of slavery with his book Sociology for the South, or The Failure of Free Society, 1854. Fitzhugh argued that laissez-faire capitalism, as celebrated by Adam Smith, benefited only the quick-witted and intelligent, leaving the ignorant at a huge disadvantage. Slaveholders, he argued, took care of the ignorant, in Fitzhugh's argument, the enslaved people of the South. Southerners provided the enslaved with care from birth to death, he asserted. This offered a stark contrast to the wage slavery of the North where workers were at the mercy of economic forces beyond their control. Fitzhugh's ideas exemplified Southern notions of paternalism. The North also produced defenders of slavery, including Louis Agassiz, a Harvard professor of zoology and geology. Agassiz helped to popularize polygenism, the idea that different human races came from separate origins. According to this formulation, no single human family origin existed, and black people made up a race wholly separate from the white race. Agassiz's notion gained widespread popularity in the 1850s with the 1854 publication of George Glidden and Josiah Knott's Types of Mankind and other books. The theory of polygenism codified racism, giving the notion of black inferiority the lofty mantle of science. One popular advocate of the idea posited that black people occupied a place in evolution between the Greeks and chimpanzees. Defining American, George Fitzhugh's Defense of Slavery. George Fitzhugh, a Southern writer of social treatises, was a staunch supporter of slavery, not as a necessary evil, but as what he argued was a necessary good a way to take care of enslaved people and keep them from being a burden on society. He published Sociology for the South or the Failure of Free Society in 1854, in which he laid out what he believed to be the benefits of slavery to both the enslaved and society as a whole. According to Fitzhugh, It is clear the Athenian democracy would not suit a Negro nation, nor will the government of mere law suffice for the individual Negro. He is but a grown-up child and must be governed as a child. The master occupies towards him the place of parent or guardian. The Negro is improvident, will not lay up in summer for the wants of winter, will not accumulate in youth for the exigencies of age. He would become an insufferable burden to society. Society has the right to prevent this and can only do so by subjecting him to domestic slavery. In the last place, 
the Negro race is inferior to the white race, and living in their midst, they would be far outstripped or outwitted in the chase of free competition. Our Negroes are not only better off as to physical comfort than free laborers, but their moral condition is better. What arguments does Fitzhugh use to promote slavery? What basic premise underlies his ideas? Can you think of a modern parallel to Fitzhugh's argument? Twelve point four: The filibuster and the quest for new slave states. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain the expansionist goals of advocates of slavery. Describe the filibuster expeditions undertaken during the antebellum era. Southern expansionists had spearheaded the drive to add more territory to the United States. They applauded the Louisiana Purchase and fervently supported Native American removal. The annexation of Texas and the Mexican-American War. Drawing inspiration from the annexation of Texas, pro-slavery expansionists hoped to replicate that feat by bringing Cuba and other territories into the United States and thereby enlarging the American empire of slavery. In the 1850s, the expansionist drive among white Southerners intensified. Among Southern imperialists. One way to push for the creation of an American empire of slavery was through the actions of filibusters, men who led unofficial military operations intended to seize land from foreign countries or foment revolution there. These unsanctioned military adventures were not part of the official foreign policy of the United States. American citizens simply formed themselves into private armies. To forcefully annex new land without the government's approval, an 1818 federal law made it a crime to undertake such adventures, which was an indication of both the reality of efforts at expansion through these illegal expeditions and the government's effort to create a U.S. foreign policy. Nonetheless, Americans continued to filibuster throughout the 19th century. In 1819. An expedition of 200 Americans invaded Spanish Texas, intent on creating a republic modeled on the United States, only to be driven out by Spanish forces. Using force, taking action, and asserting white supremacy in these militaristic drives were seen by many as an ideal of American male vigor. President Jackson epitomized this military prowess as an officer in the Tennessee militia. Where earlier in the century he had played a leading role in ending the Red Stick War, and forcing the Creek Nation to cede millions of acres in Alabama and Georgia, his reputation helped him to win the presidency in 1828 and again in 1832. Filibustering plots picked up pace in the 1850s as the drive for expansion continued. Slaveholders looked south to the Caribbean. Mexico and Central America, hoping to add new slave states. Spanish Cuba became the objective of many American slaveholders in the 1850s, as debate over the island dominated the national conversation. Many who urged its annexation believed Cuba had to be made part of the United States to prevent it from going the route of Haiti, with enslaved black people overthrowing their captors. And creating another black republic, a prospect horrifying to many in the United States. Americans also feared that the British, who had an interest in the Sugar Island, would make the first move and snatch Cuba from the United States. Since Britain had outlawed slavery in its colonies in 1833, black people on the island of Cuba would then be free. Narciso Lopez. A Venezuelan who wanted to end Spanish control of the island gained American support. He tried five times to take the island, with his last effort occurring in the summer of 1851, when he led an armed group from New Orleans. Thousands came out to cheer his small force as they set off to wrest Cuba from the Spanish. Unfortunately for Lopez and his supporters, however, The effort to take Cuba did not produce the hoped-for spontaneous uprising of the Cuban people. Spanish authorities in Cuba captured and executed Lopez and the American filibusters. Efforts to take Cuba continued under President Franklin Pierce, 
who had announced at his inauguration in 1853 his intention to pursue expansion. In 1854, American diplomats met in Austin, Belgium, to find a way to gain Cuba. They wrote a secret memo known as the Austin Manifesto, thought to be penned by James Buchanan, who was elected president two years later, stating that if Spain refused to sell Cuba to the United States, the United States was justified in taking the island as a national security measure. The contents of this memo were supposed to remain secret, but details were leaked to the public, leading the House of Representatives to demand a copy. Many in the North were outraged over what appeared to be a Southern scheme orchestrated by what they perceived as the slave power, a term they used to describe the disproportionate influence that elite slaveholders wielded to expand slavery. European powers also reacted with anger. Southern annexationists, however, applauded the effort to take Cuba. The Louisiana legislature in 1854 asked the federal government to take decisive action, and John Quitman, a former Mississippi governor, raised money from slaveholders to fund efforts to take the island. Controversy around the Austin Manifesto caused President Pierce to step back from the plan to take Cuba. After his election, President Buchanan, despite his earlier expansionist efforts, denounced filibustering as the action of pirates. Filibustering caused an even wider gulf between the North and the South. Cuba was not the only territory in slaveholders' expansionist sites. Some focused on Mexico and Central America. In 1855, Tennessee-born William Walker, along with an army of no more than 60 mercenaries, gained control of the Central American nation of Nicaragua. Previously, Walker had launched a successful invasion of Mexico, dubbing his conquered land the Republic of Sonora. In a relatively short period of time, Walker was dislodged from Sonora by Mexican authorities and forced to retreat back to the United States. His conquest of Nicaragua garnered far more attention, catapulting him into national popularity as the heroic embodiment of white supremacy. Why Nicaragua? Nicaragua presented a tempting target because it provided a quick route from the Caribbean to the Pacific. Only 12 miles of land stood between the Pacific Ocean, the inland Lake Nicaragua, and the river that drained into the Atlantic. Shipping from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States had to travel either by land across the continent, south around the entire continent of South America, or through Nicaragua. Previously, American tycoon Cornelius Vanderbilt had recognized the strategic importance of Nicaragua and worked with the Nicaraguan government to control shipping there. The filibustering of William Walker may have excited expansionist-minded Southerners, but it greatly upset Vanderbilt's business interests in the region. Walker clung to the racist, expansionist philosophies of the pro-slavery South. In 1856, Walker made slavery legal in Nicaragua. It had been illegal there for 30 years in a move to gain the support of the South. He also reopened the slave trade. In 1856, he was elected president of Nicaragua, but in 1857, he was chased from the country. When he returned to Central America in 1860, he was captured by the British and released to Honduran authorities, who executed him by firing squad. This has been U.S. History from OpenStax. OpenStax textbooks and this free audiobook are covered under a Creative Commons license. The full text is available at www.openstax.org. This project was made possible by CC Echo, the California Consortium for Equitable Change in Hispanic Serving Institutions, Open Education Resources. You can learn more about CC Echo by visiting the link in this episode's show notes. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Instructors can even download a course shell to embed these recordings in Canvas courses.
Learn more by visiting www.openaudio.us. Did you find this audiobook helpful? If so, let us know by leaving a comment and sharing this recording with a colleague or a friend.